Welcome to EPG Patshala. In this module, we are going to discuss the short stories of James Thurba. I am Niladri Chatterjee, Professor, Department of English, University of Kalyani, West Bengal. We have to consider James Thurber as perhaps one of America's best comic writers. His genius was for comedy. And what we are going to try and understand while we are going to discuss some of his short stories is to see that when he is writing his short stories that are obviously comic, but even within those short stories, under the layer of comedy, he is perhaps also trying to make some very serious points. So there are two ways in which you can read James Thurber. You can read his short stories as just funny short stories and they are very, very enjoyable. They are very amusing. But you can also plumb those short stories for meanings that may not be overt. But if you think about them carefully, the meanings are going to become available to you. So now we start by looking at James Thurber's life. What we need to do, therefore, is we, in this particular module, we are going to talk about his life, we will talk about his times, and then there are going to be a few short stories that we shall discuss in detail. We are going to discuss perhaps his best known short story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. We are going to discuss The Night, The Bed Fell. We are going to discuss The Rabbit Who Caused All the Trouble. Then we are going to focus on The Greatest Man in the World, and finally, the night the ghost got in. Now, let us talk a little bit about the life of James Thurber. James Thurber was born in Columbus, Ohio on December 8, 1894. James Thurber's father was a civil clerk and his mother was a rather eccentric woman whose influence uh, was profound on James Thurber's stories. From 1913 to 1917, Thurber um, attended the Ohio State University, where he was a member of the Phi Kappa Pi fraternity. Consequently, uh, what Thurber also did was he also was a part of the house at 77 Jefferson Avenue, uh, which became Thurber House in 1934. He returned to Columbus in 1920 and started working at the Columbus Dispatch as a reporter. Thurber spent his evenings working on skits for the Strollers and Scarlet Mask, the theater group at Ohio State, where he met his first wife, Althea Adams. The couple shifted to Paris in 1925 and Thurber started working on the Paris edition of the Chicago Tribune. Thurber's the Thurber's moved to New York in 1926. Now this is where something rather interesting happens. At a party, Thurber's friend E.B. White, who is incidentally the creator of Stuart Little and Charlotte's Web, introduced him to Harold Ross, editor of The New Yorker, who hired Thurber soon after the party. White and Thurber shared an office of, at The New Yorker where they worked together on their first book is sex necessary, including a number of Thurber's cartoons. So you can see that already Thurber is beginning to establish himself, if not as, as a comic writer, then certainly as somebody who is capable of drawing funny cartoons. Thurber's cartoons were featured regularly in The New Yorker. Thurber left the staff position at The New Yorker in 1935, but continued to submit cartoons and stories. And in his famous autobiography, My Life and Hard Times, which was published in 1933, this is something which I think we should talk about. Because in this autobiography, we get to see a Thurber that we now have grown to love. Because he, over here, talks about his life, but in a very bemused deadpan prose uh, and the very peculiar incidents that are related to his family and to his town. Now let me take a little bit of time to explain to you what is meant by deadpan 
expression. So when you are actually writing something in the deadpan expression, what you're really doing is you're saying something very funny, but you're saying it in such a way that is not overtly funny. It is once you read it, that is when you realize the comedy. So the deadpan expression or indeed deadpan prose is ostensibly the kind of prose which is not meant to be read as funny overtly. But once you actually look at it, then you will find that the author is actually being humorous. But the humor is not overt, the humor is covert. Moving on, Russell Baker, writing in the New, Yorker, New York Times, said that it was possibly the shortest and most elegant autobiography ever. Ogden Nash, who himself is a comic genius, also said that it was just about the best thing I have read. And Dorothy Parker, another comic genius, said, mad, I don't say, genius, I grant you. So with the publication of his autobiography, James Thurber had already established himself as a comic genius. Thurber and Althea's marriage ended in 1935, after which Thurber married Helen Wismer later that year. Helen was Thurber's editor and business manager, as well as his wife and caretaker until his death. Thurber, along with his fellow Pi Kappa Psi brother, Elliot Nugent, finally wrote in 1940 the Broadway hit The Male Animal. The play was very successful and later turned into a movie in 1942. Thurber wrote nearly 40 books and won a Tony Award for the Broadway play. A Thurber carnival in which he offered a star, uh, offered, he often starred as himself. One of his books, My World and Welcome to It, was turned into an NBC television series in 1969-1970 starring William Wyndham. Thurber succumbed to pneumonia on 2nd November 1961. He was buried in the Columbus Greentown Cemetery. Now what we shall do is look at some of his short stories and perhaps the one short story that is best known is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. The Secret Life of Walter Mitty is a short story involving Walter Mitty, a meek common man who lives in Connecticut who, who elevates himself to a position of a hero in his daydreams. So this particular short story is about a common man who lives a day-to-day -day life, there is nothing glorious about him, but in his head he has imagined for himself another life. So he has this fantasy life and the fantasy life that he has is something that he lives throughout the day. Um, and we shall see in the short story how he does that. So for example, when Walter Mitty is introduced to us, we know that he is an underachiever, he is bullied by people, be it, in the park, be it by the parking attendant or his overbearing wife, and seeks to escape from his seemingly boring and uneventful life into a world of fierce events where he is sometimes a suave doctor or a war hero. While Walter goes through an uneventful day involving ordinary tasks and errands, he escapes into a succession of romantic fantasies, each impelled on by some humdrum reality. As he drives his car, he imagines he is commanding a navy hydroplane through a terrible storm. When he rides past a hospital, he imagines he is an iconoclastic surgeon saving um, somebody's life with nothing more than a fountain pen. Yes, so when he hears a newsboy shouting about a trial, he imagines he is a crack shot being questioned in the courtroom. So every time he comes across an incident in real life, he automatically transforms that incident into something very glamorous, something very glorious, something very attractive, almost like something out of a film. As he waits for his wife to finish at the hairdressers, Walter perceives pictures of a German plane and immediately imagines himself to be a British pilot willing to sacrifice his life for his country. And as Walter Mitty waits outside um, against a wall for his wife to buy something in a drugstore, he visualizes that he is an intrepid man about to be shot at by a firing squad. The story ends with the inscrutable Walter Mitty waiting for his romantic death. His secret life 
that is his world of daydreams is as eventful and exciting as we want it to be. The story was first published in 1939 in, the, in an issue of the New Yorker magazine and this is something that was also anthologized when in October 1942 a book which was a collection of uh, Thurber's work, works was published. Now let us look in little detail about this particular short story. Let us concentrate for example on the character of Walter Mitty. Walter Mitty is a meek and an ordinary Connecticut resident you know, who's used to getting bullied and chided by his wife and on occasions by people he meets like the parking lot attendant. To compensate for his shortcomings, Mitty creates an entire secret life for himself, a series of fantasies in which he is an influential, decisive man, admired by those around him. He compensates for his failure in his real life by constructing a larger-than-life image of himself in his daydreams. James Thurber very meticulously intertwines Mitty's fictions with his real life. It's not simply a matter of leaping back and forth from reality to imagination. Each fantasy is stimulated by some definite sound or word or event in the real world. These perceptible associations between fantasy and dream remind the readers to look for deeper emotional relations. And I think this is something which we will constantly come across is that he is representing uh, life and he's representing life in a very humorous way, but also underneath the humor, he's perhaps also trying to get across a certain message to us, and we should be aware of that. Moving on, um, we shall see that um, Walter Mitty and his fantasies, well, there are two ways of interpreting them. First, and probably the more forthright approach, is to see Mitty as a placid, married man who quite harmlessly accedes to fantasy to get through what seems to be a pretty boring day of running errands with his wife. One could argue that this story is a testament of human ability to enjoy and make good of the event most banal of events. In contrast to the above idea, another way of examining Walter Mitty and consequently the story of Walter Mitty as a whole, this is something that encompasses detecting some darker themes in Thurber's work. This interpretation is probably sparked by the fact that Mitty's final fantasy is of a firing squad, which is a bit ominous. Is Mitty just endlessly persecuted by his more logically minded foes in the real world? Are his fantasies defeated by reality? Or does he remain, as Thurber writes, Walter Mitty the undefeated? So can we therefore see that Walter Mitty, in creating this fantasy life, is perhaps trying to compensate for something that he does not have in his own life? Is he, for example, trying to compensate for what he may believe to be his insufficient masculinity. Maybe he feels that he isn't male enough. So in order to make himself more male, he clearly tries to fantasize and he clearly makes himself into that kind of very glamorous um, action hero kind of man that Walter Mitty clearly is not in his real life. We now move on to the second short story, The Night the Bed Fell. The Night the Bed Fell is a short story um, which we find um, in Thurber's book My Life and Hard Times. The story is actually a brief account of an incident that took place in his house in Columbus, Ohio. The story is a memoir written in the first person, so therefore we can assume that this is James Thurber writing. The narrator shares his perceptive and very, very interesting look on a series of events ordered chronologically. There are several characters, including James Thurber himself, and several family members, such as his mother, his father, two brothers, cousin, uncle, three aunts, and his grandfather. The narrator relays an incident of his youth when a bed fell on his father. The father occasionally slept in the attic where he could contemplate in peace and in the process would eventually sleep on an old wooden bed. The house is filled with an eclectic range of family members, including a paranoid cousin afraid of falling asleep as he apprehends death by choking while asleep. 
he shares a room with the narrator who assures to pay heed to the rhythm of the cousin's breathing. One of his aunts fears the day when someone would rob her by administering chloroform. By midnight of the particular night, everyone was in bed. At two in the morning, the narrator's own bed, which is an army cot, tipped over while the narrator was still asleep. The noise awoke his mother, who thought that the wobbly headboard on the bed in the attic had fallen on the father, and a series of events gradually begin to unfold. Finally, the father opens the attic door to ask what's happening, to which the family put the incidents together to understand the crux of the matter. So as you can see, this is a rather funny story. It's a story that is based on misapprehension, misunderstanding. People are thinking something has happened, but something else has happened. But how else do we read the short story? Well, Thaba sometimes combined fiction and non-fiction, as in The Night the Bed Fell, to produce what might be deliberately called a new literary genre. You may call it faction, for example, which is a very interesting combination of fact and fiction. The development of the concept of the casual um, at the New Yorker undoubtedly contributed to this. For the moderately light tone combined with a focus on the familiar humdrum occurrences was well harmonized with the author's personality. The casual was also conducive to the technique of starting with an actual event in the writer's past and then branching off into fiction, outspreading the plot in order to carry them to an unlikely conclusion. Thurber was very good at it. He was a master of casting such premises in a purely fictive mode as well. In, in, another, in either case, the writing style remains the same, encouraging a merging of fiction and non-fiction in the reader's mind. We move on to another short story now, The Rabbit Who Caused All the Trouble. The Rabbit Who Caused All the Trouble, this is, you can think of it as a modern fable. It was published first in 1939 and they also, this also fe is featured in his book Fables for Our Time and Famous Poems Illustrated. The events in the story occur within the memory of the youngest child of an anonymous family. It concentrates on a family of rabbits who reside near a pack of wolves. The wolves declared that they did not approve of the rabbits' way of living since their lifestyle was dissimilar to that of the wolves. The wolves began to look for excuses to attack the rabbits and started a blame game. The wolves threatened to civilize the rabbits who, scared for their lives, decide to abandon their current dwelling and run away to an island. But the other animals who lived at a distance critiqued their choice and assured them of their safety. The rabbits, convinced of their safety, began to reside near the wolves but fell prey to, their, to a false accusation. The wolves attacked the rabbits and detained them in a dark cave. The wolves justified their cruelty by stating the imprisonment of the rabbits was for the protection and best interest. When the rabbits went missing for some time, the other animals in the woods demanded to know about their whereabouts, to which the wolves cunningly answered that the rabbits were consumed by them, and thus their absence is an internal matter. The other animals vehemently protested and demanded a satisfactory answer, the failure to provide which would subject the wolves to dire circumstances. So the wolves wittily remarked, they were trying to escape. This is directly from, from the story itself. And as you know, this is no world for escapists. The same that had been told to the rabbits by the animals when they decided to leave for a safe haven. So the moral of the story states, run, don't walk to the nearest desert island. The, uh, the appeal of the allegory is ameliorated through the moral it states. The New Age fable teaches the audience survival strategies and they need to adapt in the face of ever-changing political and social scenario. Now, what exactly is happening in this particular short story? Well, one way of looking at it 
would be to say that all these characters, all these sort of animal characters that are there, the author is indirectly perhaps criticizing customs and practices of the human world without engaging in controversy. So maybe, maybe James Thurber is trying to critique a certain community of people who are oppressing another community. So the fable, the rabbits that caused all the trouble, is therefore apparently about rabbits and wolves, but maybe it isn't just about rabbits and wolves. And I think you should therefore try to understand what is being meant over here. Because please keep in mind the political background of the period to which the fable belongs. Remember that this is also the time of the Second World War. So the rabbits represent or it could very well represent the minority Jews who were ruthlessly persecuted by the Nazi Germans. So the wolves represent the majority who demonstrate an unreasonable predisposition and detestation towards the minority, the persecuted minority, the rabbits. So therefore, you are apparently, and this is the point of a fable, is that you think that this is a story about animals, but of course it isn't just about animals. Uh, behind the story, there is something that is being meant about human society. We are also going to look at the short story, The Greatest Man in the World. This is perhaps um, not like the other short stories of James Thurber, because this short story is rather dark. It isn't particularly funny. It isn't particularly humorous. So this is a slightly different kind of James Thurber short story. This was published um, again in the New Yorker um, and what is the story about? It is the life of somebody called Jack Smirch. Now Jack Smirch is supposed to have gone around the world without a halt and he is considered a superhuman person and due to his valiant endeavor the people of his country worship him as a hero but to the surprise of the press and the politicians of his day, it is discovered, paradoxically, that this so-called hero has many unheroic characteristics. He is insolent, he is a delinquent, or at least he was a delinquent, he is a philanderer, he is a very acquisitive man, treating authority with downright impertinence. So here is somebody who is perhaps what the polite society would not particularly want to meet. So this so-called hero affronted all pilots who had flown before him. He was heartless enough to mock the failed attempt of two Frenchmen who died in an attempt uh, to cross the Atlantic Sea by plane. So when we look at the way in which he has structured the sto short story, what do we see? We see that there is a lot of excitement surrounding this man. He created an absolute ruckus by denigrating everyone present at the gala event which is organized to honor him and his insolence was manifested in its full form when he failed to recognize the president of the country, the president of the United States. Sadly, one of the party's patrons decided, with the president's inaudible permission, to push the man out of the window thus providing the final solution to the question that had been plaguing the media and the bureaucrats for long, how to maintain the farcical greatness of this not-so-great, unheroic hero in the public eye. And as you can imagine, the funeral was a lavish affair, and the hero, who was by now disliked by most of his townsfolk and family members, he is celebrated and he is mourned as if uh, the world is devastated at his death. How does one look at this short story? Well, the story offers an, uh, a rather interesting treatment of the media and politics and also about the way in which heroes are created. There is also another way of looking at it. The media and the politicians are, like always, um, disguising the truth. But by glorifying a non-heroic hero just to protect the image of an idealized, conceptualized American hero from society. Can we therefore read this short story as a critique of the American dream? Can we therefore say that the person who is being actually extolled upon, the person who is being celebrated as an American hero is perhaps not so? 
In the end, of course, the hero is killed. And he is killed so that his reputation of the hero can permanently be frozen in time. So whether it be America's soldiers in the world wars or the view of the perfect family that existed at that time, I think what James Thurber is trying to point towards is the way in which a national culture creates heroes out of people who may very well not be all that heroic in their personal life. So therefore the title of the story is ironic. The country tries to magnify and glorify their hero who possesses none of the qualities that are actually associated with the hero and then of course he is murdered and therefore in his death he is therefore declared as a true hero and the funeral becomes a celebration of his heroism. And so therefore we uh, come to the way in which if we can sort of move on um, we are going to then see that there are ways of looking at this short story and to sort of see that this is the irony that lies at the bottom of this particular short story. So, once we have uh, looked at the short story, we realize that his fall is therefore symbolic. Although he has flown around the world, he is not a so-called hero, he has an annoying personality, he is extremely materialistic and therefore ultimately he is thrown out of a window so that his heroism can be permanently set in stone as it were. And so we have somebody who is an example as it were of the way in which heroes are created. His fall is made to look like an accident. But ironically, Smirch reached great attitude, altitude when he was flying around the world only to come home and be pushed from a window. So the killing of Smirch is perhaps some people would say and certainly the politicians would say that this is something that had to be done. They would probably say that this was a necessary evil to keep alive the concept of an ideal hero and in the minds of the American people. So look at the way in which the reputation of a man is being consolidated by basically killing him. You kill the man and once the man is dead you can therefore declare that he is a hero. So, if I have to um, discuss or if I have to therefore round up the discussion of James Thurber, I would therefore say that although James Thurber is regarded as a comic writer, but of course he is not simply a comic writer. There are certain darker messages that much more serious messages that James Thurber is trying to communicate through his work. So when we read his short stories, we are certainly going to enjoy those short stories as comic writing, but we are also going to be aware of the fact that through the comedy, James Thurber is perhaps making certain very profound statements about American life, about American society and about American culture. Thank you.